we, George is going to um, participate too, and we're gonna, George and, um, and Trina have worked together and made some records together before, so um, maybe we can uh, we can get started. Um, how would you like to start, George? Well, um, you know, I, just, I have to say, I, uh, in my capacity, running running a couple record labels, working with uh, I don't know, do you prefer to call an engineer or producer or either one? Of the, yeah, 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 it's the same thing. It ends up being the same thing. Well, why don't we start there? Why is, why is an engineer and a producer the same thing? Did you click on Oh, so, because I don't know how to work a lovely or mine. Very nice, okay. Um, everybody in the room ends up being a producer, um, and that's really the truth. There is the named producer, and that person is going to make a lot of money. They're going to have royalties on the record, and they're going to... Um, receive a lot of accolades if it does well. They're also going to receive the wrath of the industry if it fails. Um, but really, once you start making records, you realize everybody in there has to be the producer. I always, I started my career in, in, in the recording industry um, exposed to some very powerful producers, some very wealthy and successful producers and saw all the good things they did and also the bad things. But one thing that I noticed regularly was that what they didn't allow was the artists to produce themselves. And I always felt like um, a little humbled that I had ever had success so that I thought, well, the last thing I would ever want to do is make an artist feel as though I knew some secret in there or some, some I had some knowledge that they would not be allowed to have for themselves. And um, so I was, I, I felt very sure that given any authority in the room, I would make the artist feel part of the production. Um, and then I started to realize that the artist really was the producer too, and that I had information that they needed, and I had um, organizational skills that would be handy for them, and I understood things that they needn't cloud their mind with about budgets, about dealing with the administrators at labels, um, about scheduling and booking studios. So. I thought, well, the artist has to learn how to be the producer, too, and then they have to teach me how to um, be a songwriter and a record maker. So in that way, I found that being a producer and an engineer and a mixer are the same things. And, um, and so even now, if I'm approached to produce a record, I insist that it's a co-production with me and the artist. And that way, if it fails, also, we stand hand in hand together to say, we, just, we did this together. I didn't do this to the artist. And if it um, does really well, the artist can feel very empowered to walk up to the console and say to an engineer that may be being bossy or, or challenging, I don't like what you're doing to my vocal. Let me see the EQ. No, no, don't turn that off. I don't want that on there. Um, I got to record Neil Young once, which was a thrill. Um, and he was so well versed in recording, he I wanted, that almost made me cry because he's a hero, but then he also is like, what you get on the voice? I'm like, well, we're using an API, and I like the 560s, but I'll the 8K, and like, he, he talked to me in my language, and then I just, I, I found that very impressive, that such a, such a titan also knew all about the compressors that were being used, and uh, knew how to talk to me in a language that I could understand, and um, so yeah, producer, artist, recordist, mixer, and our representative, it's all really, whoever's sitting in that room and is willing to spend 14 hours in there mm -hmm. is a producer. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of A&R people, I think, uh, and I, I, never, I tried to never do this, either I was going to spend no time there or I was going to be there, because the idea that you can kind of come in, listen to a song, and, and have any right at all to comment, I was kind of a little bit insulting uh, to the project. <laughs> but um, it took you a rather circuitous path to learn that language that you call your language now. Can you Talk a little bit about how you. I am. Um, do, can we do anything about this? The, the kind of funny sound of the mic? It's, uh, it's a lot of mid range in this mic. Yeah. 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 We can talk. Can we take some AK out. We can talk really low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe up here. Um, oh, yeah. My, my God. Hang on. Level. Might be right on here. See, here's a foreign little thing. Yeah, I'll see. This is more like union gear. <laughs> so, um, Did you find a love? No. I, I just oh, oh, you did. <laughs> the language in the studio, too. First, I'll tell you guys, because this is a music industry forum, and I happen to be in the, the section of the music industry that is recording and, and, um, and making records. 
but it didn't start out that way. Yeah. I started out as a secretary at, I started out working at a record store in a little town in Illinois. And, and I started out with a four track, of course, and I started out um, going to see bands and clubs and sneaking up to Chicago. And uh, but something about the person, and it was always a guy at that point, who was over by the soundboard, was always really appealing to me, mostly because I thought, well, that person gets their own space without all the drunk, nasty people everywhere around them, and they're in the center, and they must hear very well, and they've got perfect visual, and I thought, I want to kind of stand in there to see the show, because that seems to be the optimum place to see the show, and, and uh, little thoughts would occur to me on who is that person, but nonetheless, I, I did start as a secretary in a record company, because they wouldn't hire me in the studio where I applied. And I worked my way up through Capitol Records to become a marketing manager. I had an expense report and a company car and a space in the not the main executive lot, but the secondary executive lot, which was a big deal. And, um, and a little office in that round building. And I learned a lot in working in the record business at working at a label that actually was very relevant later when I when I had to um, become the producer on record and, and um, turn in budgets and be responsible for money that was being provided. The label can be vilified very quickly and often should be, but, but underneath, um, we romanticize the music business, all of us do, I certainly still do. The music business, there's nothing wrong with it. Someone asked me that once, what's wrong with the music business? And I thought, well, nothing, because they're underneath all of the nice labels and the, and the um, Romanticizing is a, is a high-powered money-making machine that wants to make money. And so it works, it functions beautifully in that capacity. It makes money. Um, and we need their money to make records. Less now because people have studios in their basements and access to Pro Tools and anybody can record their own record. But certainly when I started, that wasn't the case. You had to go to a studio when they were expensive and somebody had to give you that money. And so it was this machine that gave that money. and. Um, but there's good and bad in everything, and the music business in and of itself isn't inherently evil. It's just that um, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of money that's funneled into one individual becoming a pop star, and um, a lot of other individuals that could use just a little piece of that money get none. However, if you want to make music for a living, get ready and just do it. I mean, you may or may not succeed. You may or may not succeed making records. I, I'm a success. I'm a success in my own mind because I get to make a living doing this, but I didn't, I've never made a million dollars. I don't have, you know, I, I, I don't demand, you know, millions of dollars to make a record. I will still go in and work for 500 bucks if that's what you have. And um, anyway, I'm rambling. Can, can we give another no. <laughs> Everything you're saying is good. Wonderfully important, and it's very interesting because when it was last week we had an artist who was signed to Capitol here. Uh, you know, the, the perceptions that we all have regarding record labels all different from our, are, are all different because of our different relationships to those labels. And I ran one, I had a perspective of it. You work with them not in the capacity of an artist, but A, as someone who used to be an employee of a label, and then work with them as, as a quasi employee, as a producer. Um, you have a different perspective as the artist. That's a completely different perspective. So it, it, I think it's, it's wildly instructive to talk to these, you know, people that are all getting ready to engage in that world in one capacity or another, and see that it, it is a different perspective. But you were you kind of left off on your story about how you were working at Capital and marketing, I think, I think it was, and and it seems like a, a interesting path to get from there to where you are now. Well, I wanted to get into the studio, um, and I would hang around in the studio. I'd hang around outside the hallway that led to the studio, and I would wait until there was an opportunity for the maintenance man, Mr. Jackson, who's still there, an elderly fellow, who um, once things really shut down and there might be somebody in the mix room, he would actually let me into Studio A to look at it. Um, Can you I, give us some context of Studio A capital? What uh, records might have been made there? Well, at, at that point I didn't really know, but I knew that um, it was one of the I, I didn't really even know what it meant to go into Studio A, except for that it meant that I was in Studio A, up of Frank Sinatra and um, Miles Davis and like great artists from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, Beach Boys, you know. For all I know, um, the Beatles may have passed through there, but 
it was a famous room, and I knew that, but I didn't know why it was famous. I didn't know what made it famous. I didn't know that the Neve console in there that was one of the first that Rupert Neve had ever um, made custom for that room, and it was signed by Rupert Neve. I later um, got to work on that console, and Al Schmidt, another very successful, eminently successful engineer, signed it too, and I thought, I'm going to grab me a Sharpie. <laughs> Trina should make her. Um, but, but I was sneaking into Studio A with, with Al and the cleaning guy, and in my life, specifically, control rooms were very, very appealing to me, far more appealing than actually being on stage, which I am right now, because right now I feel a little nervous, I'm starting to sweat. And um, Good one. right, so so that wasn't that appealing. I, I grew up in a, in a strange context where I, my dad worked in a control room, but not an audio control room. He worked for Midwestern Gas um, in the natural gas industry. This control room was underground. It was a closed room, not unlike this, no windows. There were a lot of meters and valves and knobs, and um, it was quiet. It, it, you controlled the light with big uh, um, knobs, like you do in a, in a, a studio. And I found comfort there, and as an adult, I realized that I recreated to a certain degree the, a zone of control. I mean, I am a control freak. There's no question about that. Do you have to be a good engineer? Absolutely. You absolutely do, but you have to know when to stop controlling. Um, I, I like, I, I'm, I'm easy to please. I, if I can control the lighting, the level of the music, and the sound, I'm happy. I don't want to control an artist's music. I don't want to control, um, their lyrics. I don't want to control their music or their parts. I want to control how loud it is. I want to control how the track sheets are organized. I want to control the Sharpie supply. I want to be in control of the strip of tape. I don't want anybody else's writing on it, ever. Yeah, my assistants all know that now. Don't fill it out. Let her. I like to look at my own writing. Um, you have to know when to stop controlling, but you do have to be very, very organized to be in there. Um, I know there are a lot of women out here today who are probably in the recording program and are wondering, you know, what's going to happen, what that's like, and, and sexism and all those questions. They, they don't, they're, they're not really relevant. I, um, I'm only now starting to realize what it's going to mean to be a woman in, in the recording industry because now I'm going to have a baby and I actually have to be pregnant and have the baby, therefore I have to um, not go into the studio because you can't bend over, okay, there. Number one, if you're pregnant and you're an engineer, you can't bend over after a certain amount of time. Your feet swell, so you can't sit for a certain amount of time, so I'm having to remove myself a little bit from the studio. Once the baby's born, he's gonna come uh, with his mama or his daddy to the studio, and I'm gonna set up an ISO booth as the nursery, and I'm gonna boom a microphone above him, and it's gonna be on a meter, and then I'll know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, as, as a new father, that's a wonderful so, idea. So, I mean, you're not going to be limited um, as long as you are able to lift. You're going to be required to lift amplifiers, wrap cables. It's a strenuous, physically exhausting work. Um, so, going from the. Oh, uh, I'm kind of, once I'm kind again, of, so there I am, no. standing outside the hall yeah. at the studios at Capitol <laughs> Records. And we had, I'm I not had, devaluing the, the, the other expository no, you, you thing. Will, I'm just to me. Um, I went to a marketing meeting. I was 24 years old. I had done you know, maybe 23 very, very well. I did not go to college um, because something inside me uh, made me get in a car instead at 18 and drive myself to California and get a job at a record company. Um, anyway, I went to a marketing meeting and the director of marketing, they were all fighting and there all these executives, all these extremely high paid executives about why the Great White Record didn't sell as well as... For those of you who don't know, Great White was a band. A band. Yes. <laughs> and maybe, a, a, I guess we can, we can generously right. call them a band. A band. Maybe, yeah. um, why their record didn't sell as much as Def Leppard's Pyromania. And I just said, the Great White Record sucks, and Pyromania is a great, it's a very cool record, and you guys not listened to it? And I was really reprimanded for making that comment later by the head of marketing, and I was just like, but wait a second, it's just, is this, this is a fact, we're arguing here over why one record didn't sell and the other did, but one's a great record and one isn't, you guys don't listen to music. Hmm. Um, and at that moment I thought, I'm in the wrong business, this is a mistake, I want to be in the studio, they won't hire me. 
In the 80s, I was told by all the major studios they didn't hire women. A&M went so far as to tell me that women would be a distraction in the control room. And I, all I kept thinking is like, I'm not that beautiful. I'm really not. And um, if I was, I could see this, but I'm just pretty, I'm, I'm okay looking, I'm fine. But anyway, so I, um, I quit my job one day. I walked into Rowan's office and I quit. And I sold everything that I owned and I moved to London. And I got a cold water flat in a basement in a nasty part of London. And I worked as a barmaid again. And I, and I was a failure at 24, as far as I was concerned. And then a manager from um, my days back at Capitol came into the bar to get drunk and said, what are you doing here, love? <laughs> and, um, I, and I said, I'm, I'm going to be a barmaid now in London. And uh, he was leaving his office for six months to come to America to work on a movie that would be called Home Alone. This man's name is Tarquin Gosh. He's a very famous producer of movies. And, and uh, he was an artist manager then. And he asked me if I would come and run his label, or his, his, his management office, rather, um, in London for six months. And I thought, well, that's me being a record company secretary again, but I need some money, and I'm cold, and I'm hungry, and I'm afraid. So I, I moved into his apartment. He left me with his, to run his little office. And in the basement of that office was an artist named Hugh, who had a studio. And he had a little Tascam board and, and a Tascam 16-track tape machine and a computer with Cubase on it, which is way long gone. And I said to him, I want to be an engineer, don't laugh. And he said, Lou, uh, stop punching after I say, put the thing you hear here. I can't do the English accent. Nonetheless, he said, punch my vocals then tonight, and taught me how to punch vocals. And I didn't even know what that language was, punch vocals. I didn't know what patch cables were. I knew really nothing. But I'm over the valley. Don't I breathe? Wait. <laughs> oh, well, right. Well, I'm not so conscious, but I'm learning how to well. Right. They're all. It's all. That's right. But he was a real. You know, tough melt. He was a, a, this gorgeous Jamaican big split hanging out of his mouth, and and he was signed to Capitol. Um, so here I am on the backside, punching these vocals in the basement, and I'm really frightened at that point. But I'm learning how to punch and how to do this thing. I'm engineering. And he's the one who told me, you're great. Your sense of sound is, is awesome. It's so natural and it's so unruined. How, how important was it to hear someone tell you you were great at that he point? Made the, he, I, I could attribute the entire reason that I'm here right now to Hugh Harris. He knows it. Um, he just looked at me and he said, you're, you are an engineer. You're fantastic at this. You can do this. And I worked with him for months in his basement. He taught me all kinds of things. I'm like got my books, I'm like, amplitude, I don't understand this word. It's a, it's a volume, oh, it's a little NATO volume. <laughs> <laughs> now you're bothering your right. baby with this. Yes. So, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, he went on tour with Sinead, Car Tarquin came back, um, and I left. And I hitchhiked from Amsterdam to Istanbul, and I uh, just wandered the globe for a little while. And then I got back to Los Angeles, broke and thought, okay, I want to be an engineer. <laughs> Went to the studios again, but they still didn't hire women in the 80s in Los Angeles. So I uh, went to a little recording school, learned how to do tape machine alignment, and um, once again found myself very poor and lost. And then I was temping at Capitol, which was very humiliating, because I had left as an executive and came back as a temp. And, um, and I got on a plane in the middle of the night and I flew to New Orleans and I didn't know a soul here. Um, and I, I, uh, I stayed at a little, uh, I went to the Hummingbird as my first place when I got to town, which was a mistake. You guys might not remember this place, but believe me, it was harsh. And then I found a little place in the French Quarter that I rented for a week and I applied at every studio in New Orleans. I got hired as a maid at Ultrasonic. And then my career began. And I started learning how to record music. Um, but again, there was no Pro Tools then. It, there was, if there was, it was in its infancy. And I learned how to make patch cables, how to build patch base, how to recap the electrolytic capacitors on um, modules and consoles. And I worked um, all day, every day. I temped in the morning as a typist for a temp firm, data processed. And then at noon, I got off, so I worked from 6 till noon typing. 
and then I would go to either ultrasonic, and I also lied at Muddy Waters, and so that I was a very successful live sound engineer out in LA, and I did some live sound there. And, um, but I worked for free in studios in the afternoons, and I bartended at night. And so I worked all the time, and I worked 14 to 20 hours a day every day um, for really what was my entire 20s. Um, I got you know, some breaks, too. But all that, all that it will be your own personal <coughs> story. Everybody will have a different way that they find their way in. Um, those ridiculous commercials that are just, just <coughs> do it for the right reasons, it, it, it does matter what your intention is. Wanting to be rich and famous is extremely valid. Wanting to be an artist is, is very valid. Wanting to be the person who's heard and seen is just as valid as the person who uh, wants to be the control freak behind the, the thing going, <coughs> doing the knobs. Um, wanting to be the artist, but, but you can't sort of want to be both. You have to choose at one point, I'm either going to be the engineer or a producer, or I'm going to be the artist. You will get to be both later, but initially it's better just to pick one or the other and focus on it. Because sitting in a studio as an engineer when you wish you were the guitar player will make you bitter and unpleasant to be around. I didn't want to be the guitar player or the singer. Luckily, I didn't if want to sleep with the guitar up. player either. That was helpful. <laughs> if you want to be, you, you, you know, you, you get this discussion with saying that there's really no distinction between a producer and a engineer, and, and, and I, I understand. but. You know, in, in many studio scenarios, there is a producer and an engineer. Right. Did you want to be the producer? No. Can I you, wanted can to you elaborate concert. on that a little? I mean, I think because I, I think that there may be some, maybe there isn't, but there may be some gray areas between, you know, okay, so what, what is the producer doing? What is the engineer doing? Um, and, and I only bring this up because I think it, it is still very prevalent in the, in the industry now. It, it changes a lot. Um, if you come into the studio as an artist first, and you're going to produce another artist, then your language with that artist will be all musical. I, I, I started out as an engineer by default. Um, I knew that I wanted to have control of the equipment in the room, and it was as simple as that. I wanted to control the volume. I wanted to control the panning. I mean, I specifically wanted to control these very tactile aspects of music. It wasn't vague. It wasn't like, hmm, I think I want to control some particles in the universe. I wanted, I thought, I want to pan that piano. Did you care what side. the music was? No. It, it could have been, could have been Death anything. Leopard or Great White. Yeah, it could have been either one. I wanted to know, when I was young, I would put on headphones back in the days of just a simple hi-fi. And um, I, I couldn't believe how things were over here and here and here and here. And the, the scope of panning, I, I desperately wanted to pan music as, as kind of plain as that sounds. I wanted to pan, I wanted to control presence, and I wanted to be left alone. So um, if I could sit in that chair as an assistant, I knew it. If I could just sit there and be left alone with the volume up, the producer could be right there saying blah, 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 blah. But if I could act it out, I could, um, I could, um, it's a very physical thing for me in there. Again, it's not, Ambiguous. It's not. Um, it's, it's. It's not like. Um, I, I actually get physically involved with the console, and so the engineer was the right place for me to be. I wasn't a songwriter then. I didn't play instruments. I do now, but then I didn't. So I didn't. Certainly didn't want to have to interact with an artist <coughs> musically. I knew I felt music deeply. What made you? What made you start playing? I mean, is that an important well, I actually secretly played me instruments the whole time, but I was very, very shy about it. I did not want to be, um, I didn't want to be noticed for that. I just wanted to inside think, oh, I know what you, I know what note you mean to hit. Um, and when the time came, I'd be able to say, you need to go to that note. And I'd be able to mimic them so that um, I'd been mimicking everybody the whole time, running home and. I, was, I, I still am very um, secretive about music that's inside of me. I have no idea why. It's my, my private world, extraordinarily private. Um, but I needed to first know, be very confident that with an artist I could talk the language of music before I started blurting out what I thought should go in the B section. Well, I guess I, guess I keep coming back to these issues of communication. You know? 
and you, you've spoken a lot about the, you know, some of the some of the elements of communication you learned by being forced. You refer to it as, as the maid. I don't, you know, want to put words in your mouth, but but being the maid apparently, and men building cables, building pad spaces, those types of. That's an element of communication. Be the you, meant clean the toilet. Okay, so Being you were doing. Assistant meant build the okay, cables. Okay, you said why you were okay. So <laughs> during that time, you were learning how to do these things, which allowed you to begin to learn the language of the studio. Um, learning the musical language is a different language, and um, it's all about being able to effectively communicate. And th how does that how does that impact on you know your success or failure with an artist? And, and I'm asking this question because I think that there are, are students out there that. Um, maybe question, why do I have to learn these things, be they musical notes or, or technical things? And I'm, I'm a big proponent of knowing those things for just what you're talking about, for communication. It's all communication there. I think um, if I stripped it down, the, the main thing that brought me any kind of success was the ability to communicate with an artist, uh, with, with human beings, and be a diplomat in there, because it can go south really quick and, and um, and, and for one thing, you get blamed very quickly for it going south, especially if it's not going well. Artists are mercurial. You're all obviously artists. You wouldn't be in this room right now. Um, you don't want it. It's really easy to hurt someone's feelings in there, too, by very quickly saying, you're, you're saying it flat. You know, and, and it, when I finally decided to write music, playing it for people is very difficult for me. I'm very shy. I don't want to be criticized. I don't want someone to go, that's a stupid line. Um, so I, I would, again, watch producers as an assistant, be very gruff with artists, and think, wow, that probably actually made them feel like shit. <laughs> so why would you want to do that in there? You want to, to enforce, even if they are flat to the track, they're completely flat to the track. Um, and, and you can hear this not because you're a genius with pitch, but because when you get in headphones and in front of a microphone, you get confused pretty easily about what's really going on. Plus, you feel kind of like an idiot um, because there's a bunch of people in the control room and they're all with pencils and you're out there trying to sing. And then to walk in and have someone go, you're flat to the track. You can snuff your buzz. You will not sing right for the rest of the night. And if money is, is going into the meter every five seconds in increments of 500 to to $1,000, and um, so the artist walks in and you might say, wow, verse two was fabulous. I love the way you're phrasing this line. I think we have a little pitch issue against the whole track. I'd like to do one more. I'm going to turn the bass up, but you're singing great, even if it isn't true. Even if you think, wow, they're singing terrible tonight. They must be in a bad mood. They don't feel good. They're tired. Find something beautiful to say about what they just did, because until you put on a pair of headphones and sit out there and try to sing yourself, <coughs> and be that person. Um, I admire artists. I'm artistic at what I do, but the, the, the heart of an artist who will get up and take the criticism as well as the accolades. Again, that's back to romanticizing what it must be like to be a star. I know a lot of stars. It doesn't seem to be that great. You take, we, we see the accolades, but they have to take the criticism too, and the criticisms are harsh. And when the ax falls, you go to the back of the line. You might be a pop star for 15 minutes, but then, then you're the has-been who's very quickly ridiculed. <coughs> um, communicate with, with whether you're going to be a politician or, or an actor or a, or a recording person or a musician or a teacher. You have to be able to communicate with people. We all carry the same heart inside us. So studio sensitive. They're putting their art on the line. In your hands, you can liken it to them handing you their child's hand for a moment, not the life of their child. It's not that dramatic, but as if they said, could you watch my kid for a little while? I gotta step out of the room. Um, their music is, 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 is so valuable, and my life goes on when the record's over. I go on to another record, but you've left the artist with what they have to live with for years, and so um, you better be able to communicate in there. If you come off as snotty, <coughs> you come off as quarrelsome or defensive or boring or annoying in any way, people won't hire you so you want to be likable. And I would like say me. that like, <laughs> I, I would say that, that, that it is that distinction that, that makes you, you know, the wonderful producer that you are. Okay. He's seen me in action. He's seen me when I go south too. Well, <laughs> yeah. but 
you're paying for five hundred dollars. Right. Uh, George is like, we'll just put another. George, can we have five grand more, please? <laughs> but 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 I think that there aren't a whole lot of engineers that I've worked with that they they get that drill, the psychologist drill, yeah. right? And I think that is what makes a great producer that ability to kind of suss up or put out a room. And, and John, being a great producer, can, can speak to it. But and, and keep that energy. But that is, in my mind, I mean, and I don't want to harp on this differentiation between an engineer and a producer. Because frankly, I don't think there is that much difference. But I, I think you know a great producer is able to do what you said, to be able to keep that momentum going, to be able to keep the artist, you know, to use the psychology. And I think that that's a, there's a lesson there. Um, just a, a very very astute. Yeah. What do you guys want? Come down here if you have a question. We'll get you on camera. What do you want to be? Like, why are you here? Anybody? Who wants to be artists? Musicians? Cool. And with the context of that, who wants to be singing? Very good. Who wants to be actors? Who wants to be engineers? There's going to be two. A lot of people do want to be engineers. Yeah. Um, and the rest of you want to work just in the industry, or maybe maybe not. Um, all right, so ask some questions, please. Ask me. Hello. Do you ever take projects that you particularly don't like the artist that much, or music that they make? I used to all the time. Um, in, in the beginning, I would record anybody under any circumstance and really take any amount of abuse that was handed my way, of which there was an enormous amount. Um, because I had to learn how to record, and actually if I didn't like you or your music, you would possibly get a better recording, because I would be so bored, truly, that I'd think, well, I will focus so deeply on the nature of sound right now that, um, yeah, I, I, I gave it even more so that I didn't hang myself with board tape from in the bathroom. Um, now, now that it's hard to do with Pro Tools. It's very that's hard to do with Pro Tools. Yeah, hard disk recording, um, you can't hang And board tape, so you have to find gaffer tape. Mm. No, I, I worked with a lot of people who I couldn't stand, and um, I'm sure they hated me too. But um, now I don't. Now, unless I don't have to like the music, but if the artist, if, if I sense anything kind of sour about the artist or something that just puts me the wrong way, I'm just too old um, to spend too much more of my life in a room with some kind of idiot. But in the beginning, yeah, I worked with um, mostly idiots, and then occasionally somebody amazing. Um, do you work for a label or are you an independent person? I'm completely independent. I never actually uh, work uh, outside of being a secretary at Capitol. Um, I uh, was an independent contractor. I did work for uh, studios, ultrasonic being one of them, and then I worked for Kingsway with Daniel Lanois, where I will not under, uh, I learned a lot in that scenario, but I worked for, for a studio. When I left the studio, I became and uh, once again, independent contractor. How much, how much, uh, how many engineers are there, <coughs> producers out there working for studios? Well, the main way, and again, times are changing right now, so you guys are going to enter a field very, very vastly different than the field that I entered. Um, you started out as an assistant at a, a professional recording facility. That's how you learned to become an engineer. Or you were hand selected by an engineer or producer to be their personal assistant, and you went with them to professional recording facilities, and were um, and, and in that way learned the trade. Now, to some degree, you can learn at home on digital recording workstations, but um, it doesn't. You, you still are going to need to be exposed to the, the facility. So. Um, yeah, everybody worked at a studio at some point. Yeah, and I misspoke. I mean, and labels was what I mean. I, I just oh, labels? N no, because labels so aren't like that anymore. They don't have staff, producers, or engineers. They have recording studios, but those are separate businesses that function separately from the, um, you know, from the company per se. There's only a few left. There's Capital still has studios. That A and M is done with because they sold theirs, and now that's Hanson Studios. Um, yeah, there's very few labels that actually have recording studios anymore. Um, yes, many times you talked about throughout your career, in the beginning you talked about how you were starving, you were cold, you were hungry. What was your motivating driving force besides what you wanted? What kept you going? Like, What would you always go back to? Wow, when I look back now, after 20 years, because I've been in this business for 20 solid years, which is 
absolutely overwhelming when I think of it that way. Personally, um, I had a, a, the only thing in my life that made sense to me um, was listening to music. And again, not even making it, but just listening to it. So I took such great solace in listening to music. Um, I was very much a loner. I was not a girl who, or a woman, who had a lot of um, relationships. I wasn't, I didn't count on anybody to take care of me. In other words, I moved out of my house when I was 17 years old and um, jumped in with the Sharks. I got my own apartment in Chicago at 17, underage, lied. Um, worked at Ogilvy and Mather, lied. Um, I was a liar. <laughs> um, to not fail. Um, I felt that I did not have a, um, a, a net underneath me to catch me if I fell. I felt that um, I would be, that I would, it, it probably wasn't true, but I had the perception that I would have nobody to help me if I fell, so that I had better make something of myself. And um, I wanted desperately to not be a failure in my own eyes. So they were very deep human emotions that kept me going, very simple ones too. Please don't be a loser or a failure. Please don't be something that um, you can't be proud of. Please don't be a dim-witted little twat. You know, please don't be married to a drunk who beats me. Um, all, a very simple, it wasn't a high-end romanticized ideas of bright lights and, and loud music and big and laminates. You know, it was nothing, it was really, please don't end up um, being abused. Like, I, I, yeah, there were simple emotions of please don't fail. Please make something of yourself. Find a way. And in, in, in basing most of my decisions on that, that, that low lying of the, or deep in the gut um, need to, <coughs> and I don't mean be a huge success, I mean just not be a failure um, at one thing. I now understand that part of my personality would have made me a success at any chosen field because I didn't want to fail and I didn't want to have to go home to my dad and you know ask for money more than anything in the world. I didn't want to ask money from my old man. So. Uh, way in the back. Do you have any advice for uh, moving out of the country? Moving out of the country? Um, don't bring a lot of suitcases. I have like to you pack one. I'm not sure I understand. Um, to, to become an engineer outside? As far as, I would say right now, do not leave the United States if you want to make records. Uh, my friends that are engineers and producers in Australia are all trying to come here. Studios are closing down like crazy in Australia, where I've worked on um, several occasions. And same in England. Um, I worked in Germany as well. Most of those people are trying to get here. However, leaving the country is uh, extremely desirable on every other level, um, especially <laughs> right now. I'd like to go to Morocco. Um, pack light, and, um, but seriously, I don't know what the, what the environment would be like to actually get a job in a studio overseas. No easier than it would be here. Is that, is that what you're asking me? Be more, tell me, to ask, ask, make it clearer for me. When you're outside of America? I guess. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I, I'm sorry. Learn how to say stop that tickles in any language. Right. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't hitchhike through um, Yugoslavia on your own. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. This is one, one, of the, one of the most dangerous places to live right here in New Orleans in America, so you're pretty good anywhere else you go. <laughs> You've worked with artists like Sheryl Crow, and then on the other side of the spectrum, I saw you work with the Queens of the Stone Age. Yes. Uh, do you have different aspects or different things you do when you record with really different artists like that? Oddly enough, no. <laughs> and that's what I've finally um, come to realize. I am the same. Um, I, I have the same diplomacy. I show up at the same time. I work the same amount of hours. Um, I get sounds in the exact same way. Now, with Queens of the Stone Age, I had to put up with a couch full of strippers behind me. They kept saying, how did you get this job? And things like that, which is very funny. And I, and I actually, um, and these girls who would normally have wanted to make me their enemy because they were, I was recording their boyfriends. 
um, they actually ended up really liking me too. In other words, I didn't exclude even them from the process. I thought, well, your little hoe self is sitting there <laughs> all day, annoying me. I'm going to drag you into this now too and actually say, D do you dig what he's playing? Because why not? You're in the room. You want to be in this room. You want to ask me questions about how I do what I do. So come on to the council too. And in this way, again, make everybody in the room your friend. Your producer. A producer friend, because one enemy in the room, and you start to get this heat at the back of your neck, because they're staring at you. And um, But I had to put up with a little bit more. I mean, there was drugs and booze and women, and the guy, this one guy, I can't remember what band he was from, he brought a dead squirrel into the control room. And like, a little, um, like, um, ceremony for it before he would sing this part. Um, very stupid stuff. Huh? No, that was right, no. So the Queens of the Stone Age, you know, had a whole dog and pony show that came with it. Literally. L literally. <laughs> Josh Homme was a very bizarre individual. But on the other side, you know, the Cheryl Crow records come with their own whole set of strangers. One time I turned around and Gwyneth Paltrow was sitting there and we're like, hi, you want Gwyneth to is going to sing. But she doesn't sing. But why? Why is she going to You know, so it doesn't matter. I face the council <laughs> again and think, I need to work on that guitar tone. <laughs> and, and I mind my own business. Same, I do the same exact thing. You had a question. Oh uh, yeah, with the uh, ever changing like music industry in the future, like where do you see your career in the future with studios shutting down? And then also, is there any artists that you haven't worked with that you want to? Well, um, I'm about to have a baby, so everything's going to change, and I don't know what what what's going to happen after that. <laughs> I know that my love for recording music is not going to change, so I will still seek opportunities to record music. Um, I may or may not, yeah, I don't, I've, I've never thought, hey, I made it, I'm set, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm never going to want for anything again. I still, I haven't worked for a few months and now I'm thinking, holy cow, i got a baby coming and I don't have any gigs lined up and what if I never work again and then how am I going to pay my mortgage and I owe this money and i got Pro Tools now but I don't really want strangers in my living room so I can't work with my you know, I, and I go nuts worried about my future but I will continue to record music. I want to record Vegas Staples. All right. So there's somebody I would really like to, um, and Greg Allman, because I've had a rock and roll crush on him since I was six. <laughs> Even though he's now probably wildly unappealing, I still want to record. <laughs> Greg Allman and Vegas Staples. Um, I will just continue to try to record music as best I can. I would like to teach a couple times a month at your recording school here at Loyola. There, I've laid it out there for the people in here. Some of this has got to be boring, but mostly, again, 20 years doing one thing or trying to do that thing and then doing that thing. Um, you know, the, the thought of miking kick drums to me is not that appealing anymore. The thought of showing you how to get a kick sound is a little more appealing to me. Because then potentially I can go to the studio and say, mic the kick, <laughs> do it like I want it done. And um, yeah, I don't want to always have to get right in front of the cabinet for the guitar and go, because you have to. You have to actually stick your face in front of a box, AC30, on your hands and knees. Now I can't do that. I have to grunt when I do it. And get the mics lined up just so, because the phase relationship, Pro Tools isn't going to change that fact. You better get your mics in phase before you go onto whatever you're recording. And in order to do that, you have to, you can think of the second line of the mic. So to me, but you're going to start as the second first. Anyway, so I actually have to waddle in there now and think, up and a little bit over just a tiny bit you know so it's you know I don't necessarily want to always be tracking I want to mix and um, and I'd like to teach a little bit I think that would be fun <laughs> so I do I do this is something that um, I spoke of while I was at some place in New Orleans recently Tape up. So if you were there, you're going to hear the same thing again. When I mix, I literally, because you have to you have to keep perspective, and perspective is very easy to lose, especially because you're in a studio. It's loud. It's exciting. Everything sounds great in the control room, and then it can sound horrifying when you get it out to the car. You're you're, you're vibing. You're you're having a great time, but perspective is a whole other thing than vibe and excitement. Perspective is truly have I got a blend that will translate onto any stereo anywhere. 
So you, you turn it up very loud when you're working your tones. Um, you're listening for distortion. You need to turn it up. Um, and it, it's exciting and it starts to fill you with the sound so that I crank it until it's loud and it's like very loud and uncomfortable for other people and they leave and I'm happy. <laughs> and, then and then I turn it down very low and then then you start to think everything sounds small, this sucks, this is, I gotta turn it back up, but you mustn't because you won't place the vocal right if you do that. So then you have to imagine on the meter bridge that the band, that is still extremely loud, but the band is tiny. And the kick drum is like that big, and the singer's like that big. See, I picture on the meter bridge a little tiny, tiny band. <laughs> and then it's very quiet, but you can think, and they're so loud, but they're so tiny. And it's true. So when you're in there mixing, just shrink the band down to where you've got the little tiny singer and a little, just think of the kick drum as this little tiny thing. So you're like, but is the kick drum still loud and loud enough in relation to the tiny mouth voice that's coming out of the new tiny singer? <laughs> then you turn up to Barbie size and to where you can picture like the singer's about that big and he or she is the focus. Whether you're guitar players, whether you think, no, it's all about the thingy. Um, it isn't. It's about the voice. It's about a relationship that exists between the voice, the bass guitar, the kick drum, and the snare drum. Period. Every single time, I don't care what other things are going on, even if it's just a person with their piano, it's still about the kick drum, the snare drum, the bass guitar, and the vocal, and the piano. Um, okay, not true. If it's just a piano and a vocal, you can figure something else out. But there's still, in rock and roll, which most of you, hip hop, once again, listen to a hip hop song, a rock song, a pop song, kick drum, bass guitar, snare, and vocal are the kind of trunk of the tree and everything else are the limbs, and I don't mean to sound mystic or anything, but it is true, until you get that relationship <coughs> correct, you can't really bring the guitars up on the sides um, and turn down and picture the band as a little tiny band, and you'll start to really understand the nature of a blend. We have to take a break so now. Anybody wants to stay for the next class, you're welcome to stay, but if you have to leave, now's the time. Thank you.